Hello. Hi, everybody. Here we are. We're back. We are. And we're getting we're getting close to the end here. This is I our know. third to last. I know. Writing fiction across sad. the world. It is. It's genuinely really sad. Yeah. Um, but we're so happy that you all are here with us, and we're actually actually on time. We learned it. We learned how to do it right before it was too late. So here we are. Right. Like. There's enough of a delay that if we start early, yeah, yeah. in theory, it will show up on time mm -hmm. for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Today's going to be a little different, too. Today, we're, we're switching roles a little bit. Mm -hmm. you're, you're steering today. Um, it's me. Yeah, which means uh, that, uh, although I think you still have the info on the cause that we are supporting. Yes. Today. So, it's not exactly an organization this time but the mm -hmm. link that we have put in the description um is just i think it's an instagram story mm -hmm. um that's being updated uh with venmos maybe also paypals i'm not sure um of just young black people in need that you can give directly to um so i understand that for some people that might be kind of uncomfortable uh because you might not feel like you can trust that um but it's i mean it's up to you but it's something that we like to do mm -hmm. um because it's a way to give directly to people um because when you give to an organization you never necessarily know exactly where that money is going to go right. um and this way you know it's going straight to a person and they're going to use it as they think best mm -hmm. um which is a pretty nice way to give. So yeah, and I think you know my personal philosophy about that is always like you know is it possible that there is somebody on this service who who doesn't need it? Like technically yeah, but my personal philosophy has always been it if you're gonna take a risk, it's better to take a risk that could help people. Yeah. Uh, and could lead to you getting duped than uh, refusing to take it because there's a small chance that you got duped. Yeah. Right. And I I think it's not terribly likely that people will abuse it. Mm -hmm. Um, in my experience, it's very uncomfortable to ask for money yeah. and you don't really do it unless you need it. Yeah. Um, so check that out if that's something you're comfortable with. Um, and I guess we can move along to submissions. submissions. And I get to start the submissions this week. Yeah. This week is my do it. <laughs> wow. Um. Kevin do it. So your, your prompt for today was just 200 words of the story that you're writing, which is really, really cool. And it's been super nice to see where you all are at. The one that I picked, uh, just left my phone. Here it is. <laughs> the one that I picked is by Chloe Autumn. It is an excerpt from their story, Dreamwalker. Uh, and I'm gonna read it out loud now. So buckle up. You buckle? Because mm -hmm. it's about to get wild. <laughs> uh, the last night you have together before the dreaming you find her sleepwalking in the kitchen. You don't know what exactly wakes you up, but you're alone when you do. You check windows and doorways until you find her standing in the kitchen, where you silently guide her into a chair. The doctor told you never to wake her up when she's sleepwalking, so you just wait. You crack your knuckles and pace and crack your knuckles again, but you listen to the doctor. They assured you both the first time it happened that she isn't dreaming, Sleepwalking is similar, but not innately dangerous, and so you cling to that fraying thread like it's a lifeline. She is not dreaming. She is still safe. She mostly sits still, but sometimes she moves her head or her hands nebulously. Although you're unnerved by how distant she is when she sleepwalks, you find yourself watching her resolutely and cataloging every everything tonight. The line of her wrist as she dips her hand into the window frame cut of moonlight the shiver of her curls as she turns her head. What is it like to brush up against the edge of dreaming, you wonder? To tread next to that long since severed limb of sleep? You will never ask her that. When she wakes, you smile and offer your hand. You memorize the pattern of her fingers against your palm unconsciously, like your body knows how little time you have now, how rapidly the night is waning as you lead her back to bed. Mm. As Dreamwalker. I, I love a lot about this. Nice. Um, and also, uh, Clay Autumn says this is the first time that they've submitted something for writing fiction. So Well done. Yeah, and this is a, it's definitely not too late. We got two more of these after this uh, in our last one. Um, not going to tell you what our secret plans are yet. We'll probably tell you next week. 
Yes, right. we do have exciting plans for the last. Yep, and workshop. it'll be especially Kevin's birthday party. My birthday party, and it'll be especially exciting for those of you that submit your stories. So, if that's incentive, we'll tell you exactly what you can look forward to next week. Yeah. Um, talking about Dreamwalker for a second, though, there are some amazing descriptions in here, and this does a really good job setting up where the story might go next. We know there's something really dangerous about dreaming. Mm -hmm. She's relieved that it's just sleepwalking and not dreaming, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's I really looked, atmospheric. It's very atmospheric. Yeah. Uh, the line that I kept thinking about after I read it for the first time was um, the to tread next to that long since severed limb of sleep. That's a great description because you know what we were doing with concrete and abstract language the other day. The severed limb of sleep is a really good image because even though you're just talking about a separation from sleep, by describing it so violently, the entire process sounds really, really violent. It sounds really kind of disturbing. Yeah. Um, and so that really plants the mood right in the audience's head. And I absolutely love that. I think uh, Chloe Autumn, you did an amazing job. Yeah, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Nice. Um, okay, so the one that I'm going to be reading is by Remus. It's called Persephone. Rest here for the winter. A pomegranate lies upon the table between them, each seed bloody as a vow against the stone. Through the walls, ancient shrieks of agony and retribution can be heard, echoes from souls upon the eve of judgment. I've made promises. Laced with her own, Hades' fingers are cold, cold and familiar and beloved. I will not ask you to break them. Persephone withholds her smile. My mother will deny this. She will rage against your door. She will turn our love into a mockery, a tale to warn against. I care for no one's opinion but your own, he vows, kneeling before her. The length of his robes is dusty with ash, the bone of his crown worn with age. I would outlast any siege your kindred wage. Forsake the purpose of my existence to provide each petal of your joy safe haven. Zeus thinks, my brother is a fool, he snaps. Persephone's hand summons nightshade to wind down his neck, a collar of poisonous devotion. He is a king. Hades grimaces. He is self-proclaimed. If he forbids this union, he will not, Hades rumbles, the earth beneath them flashing with the threat of encroaching, burying wealth. Persephone laughs, light as a petal upon the breeze. She presses a kiss to his brow, lips brushing ancient weathered bone. You are the bravest being I am privileged to know. With a crook of her finger, the pomegranate alights in her palm. Before her, Hades falls deathly still. The scent of oleander is thick upon the air. Persephone plucks six seeds from within the rind. The juice stains her fingers bloody. So that we cannot be unbound, she whispers to him before no witness but the knight herself. Whatever tale is told, my hand will be within your own, my soul tangled within your halls. The seeds are sweet as winter frost upon her tongue. That's wonderful. Yeah. Something that I really, really like about it is that all of the description is very much tied to the mythology of the god yep. that it's talking about, and that's really consistent. Mm -hmm. Um... So there's, um, well, uh, the earth beneath them flashing with the threat of encroaching, bearing wealth, because Hades is the god of wealth. Mm -hmm. The way Persephone laughs is light as a petal upon the breeze, because mm -hmm. she's a goddess of springtime and nature. Mm -hmm. um, the juice stains her fingers bloody because of death and the mm -hmm. underworld. Um, and I'm, uh, I like that that does, I mean, we talk a lot about efficiency, right? That does mm -hmm. double duty because it connects metaphorically to the myth mm -hmm. and also it's really strong description absolutely i think that a lot of these also do something that we didn't really get a chance to talk about when we talked about concrete language which is you know when we're when we're teaching these concepts we do big exaggerated broad strokes but uh all language but especially english because english is just a bunch of other languages hastily stapled together <laughs> um i you can get a lot of middle ground uh emotion too that's less clear I absolutely love the seeds are sweet as winter frost upon her tongue because that sounds very refreshing and it sounds threatening and 
It's iambic? The seeds are sweet as winter frost upon it. Almost. Them. It's very, very close. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we never we never did meter, but mostly because that's... Annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's annoying, and it's also my hobby horse. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's I, I, I really, really like this. I really like it a lot. It's good. And I, I mean, certainly I'm always a sucker for, um, like, retellings of myths, mm -hmm. right? We're obviously changing it up because... It's supposed to be a myth about Hades uh, kidnapping and raping Persephone, but we're retelling it as um, them being in love and her mother retelling the story, mm -hmm. or mistelling the story purposefully, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very cool interpretation. Um, you love a good adaptation. I do love a good adaptation. I feel like the gays love myths. The gays seem to particularly love Hades and Persephone. I feel like maybe mm -hmm. it's because of Hades Town. I don't really know, but... Um, mm -hmm. But we do love it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we love mm -hmm, to see it. Mm -hmm. Hades is definitely bi. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at him. Mm -hmm. Bi. <laughs> Zeus probably is too, but not not in a cool way. I mean, he's canonically yeah. bi. Yeah. <laughs> um, Poseidon is the only straight male representation of Greek mythology. <laughs> um, so thank you for submitting, everybody. There were so many good ones this week. Um, and we'll be sharing a lot more soon. So if we didn't share yours, don't get discouraged. We're going to come back for you. Yeah, keep submitting stuff. Um, but with that, you ready to take it away? Yeah. Um, okay. Let's flip on over. Bing! I just flipped the switch. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> flip, flip. I, I flipped the switch. You just flipped the switch. Flip, flip. <laughs> do you want do you want to click through or should I? Um, I don't know. Can I do it with the space bar? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So this week we are talking about not just uh, writing podcasts, but producing podcasts in general. Because mm -hmm. we, over the course of this workshop, have received a lot of questions that aren't just about writing, mm -hmm. uh, but are about how do you make a podcast. So. Uh, how to handle every aspect of podcasting if you're us. And the reason that I'm saying that is because we did it the specific way that we did it. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it's not going to work for everybody uh, because we come from the specific circumstances that we come from. Oh, <laughs> I'm looking at the chat and somebody pointed out that Poseidon is definitely by, right. which I think I did know. <laughs> okay. All right. I think most of them are. I, okay, all right. Yeah, no, that makes sense. <laughs> well, anyway, thanks for pointing it out. Um, anyway, so so this is a lot to do with how we got to where we are with our podcast, um, and hopefully some of it will be useful for you. Um, but we do know that not everybody is in exactly the same circumstances that we are, mm -hmm. um, and we do want to acknowledge that. So take what you can from this. Mm -hmm. Okay, do I, if I press the space bar, will I think so. Let's find a out. good thing happen? Bing. Yay! There we worked. go. Okay, so one of the questions that we got was, how do I find people to create with, and how do I find actors for the podcast? Um, so for us, these questions are very much the same, mm -hmm. um, and I realize that they may be separate things for for some. Um, but, I mean, we, from the very beginning, just worked with our friends. Yeah. <laughs> um, and... Now, I think a lot of people may know about the origins of the Penumbra, um, and if you don't, uh, we didn't, we did not set out to write a podcast. Mm -hmm. That's not how this came to be. We weren't like, oh, we like podcasts, let's make one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm realizing that for a lot of you, that may be where you're coming from, but it super was not for us. Uh, where we came from was we were listening to old radio plays from the 40s, and we were like, let's do that just for fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we weren't even going to put it like online or anything. It was just a fun project to do that we looped some of our friends into. Um, and that's why the format of the show is so incredibly bonkers at the beginning uh, because it wasn't meant to be a podcast. Also, uh, as we discussed earlier today, we like thought we invented fiction podcasts. A little bit. Yeah, we did zero research on the field before we got there. Yeah. Uh, or, or no, no, no. Before we, before we uh, recorded the episodes, we did look around a little bit one, before we started posting. A little bit. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's kind of funny to me because, you know, people will be like, oh, were you influenced by like this other podcast or whatever? And we're like, no, we thought we were the first fiction <laughs> podcast there was. <laughs> like we didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. um, so 
and the people we worked with were just our friends. Um, so that being said, one piece of actual advice I do have when you're looking for people to create with, I mean, it is useful to, to uh, get your friends to be a part of it, but really what I think you need to look for is people who are at the same level that you are. And what I mean by that is people who um, have a similar level of experience and frankly talent that you do, mm -hmm. uh, which I think takes a certain amount of self-awareness, obviously. But the fact is, like, if you're brand new to something, you can't expect people who are experienced in the field to be enticed to work with you because why would they? Mm -hmm. You know, like when we started, we were not like, oh, I'm going to find this professional highly paid actor because they're super good and so they should be on my show like we sort of hadn't earned it mm -hmm. so we always particularly at the beginning looked for people who we thought were talented but were amateurs like mm -hmm. didn't have experience because the idea was that we would grow together and i think we did um so so like people that are passionate about the same thing that you're doing um and people who have a similar amount to offer that you do, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know if you have anything. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that what's interesting is looking back a lot of the, the original core crew of our podcast in ways that are still affecting casting things like four years later was really just a weird, like dumb luck situation of actors who we did think that they were all good. We wouldn't have cast them if we didn't think they were good. But the like real uh, the real uh, sorry lost it the real the real uh, you know primary reasons that these are the people that we grabbed is because they were friends they were nearby so they could get to us because mm -hmm. uh, we had plenty of friends who were not nearby mm -hmm. uh, and so they were not in the running for a while uh, and also to be honest they were patient. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say who, but there were a couple people who early on in our process didn't buy the didn't buy the show at all. Uh, yeah, and didn't think it was particularly good. Yeah, but they stuck. <laughs> they stuck with it because you know they're they're really good friends, and um, I think they're happy that they stuck with it. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, ugh, what was I gonna say? <laughs> I lost it. I'm sorry. Vamp for me. <laughs> that's not helpful um but yeah so so you're like looking for people who are at about your level and are passionate about what you are doing oh i remember what i was going to say um which is that you also want to play to their strengths mm -hmm. um so like if you are finding actors for example um you know, you want to pick people that you do already think are talented, but also you want to, if you're writing for them, you want to write towards what they're good at and write around how they actually sound. Yep. Um, I often say that, like, <laughs> a really big part of um, successful acting is just good casting. <laughs> you know, like, you want... some Like, sometimes somebody's experience with acting is less important than mm -hmm. how they, how good they are in that particular role. Mm -hmm. um, and not to use an example from our show, but I've used this example a million times before, which is the Terminator. Um, mm -hmm. Because Arnold Schwarzenegger is so amazing as the Terminator. Not because I think he's like a very good actor. No, in fact, he's a, he's a pretty bad actor. But like that role is sort of built around how he is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's it's built right around him. Like, just that he's this humongous guy who doesn't really emote very much. Mm -hmm. And because the character is written around that, it's incredibly effective. Yes. It's not really about how good he is as an actor. Right. It sounds like I'm throwing my actors under the bus. They are very talented. Right. But a very important thing that you can do is work around them right. and write for them. Right. I think you're trying to use Arnold Schwarzenegger as a really extreme example. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, and another, I think another example of that is um, if, You've seen Mad Men, um, January Jones mm -hmm. on Mad Men playing Betty Draper. Mm -hmm. um, unclear whether she's actually a good actor, but that role suits her perfectly yeah. because that character is kind of wooden and very repressed. Mm -hmm. And so if she doesn't emote very much, it's amazing. Makes sense. Um, and, oh, I think one more thing I have to say about actors 
uh, for podcasts is you want to be very thoughtful about voices. Mm. Um, I think that it has become a stylistic thing for us to have like extremely different voice types. But I, I personally, my philosophy is that you should be doing that when you make a podcast because you really don't want it to be confusing who's talking. Yeah. Um, and there are, in my opinion, there's kind of a limited number of voice types. If you just listen to the sound of somebody's voice, mm -hmm. um, there's like a limited number of categories that they fall into. Um, and you don't want to pick too many people of the same category. Like you want people who like their, um, their vocal range, you want them to be different. Um, and the way that they pronounce words to be different. Mm -hmm. And then in addition to that, you want to write and direct them so that they sound different from each other. And I do think that's really, really important because all you have to work with is the audio mm -hmm. um, and you don't want it to be confusing. So so I think that's another thing when you're looking for actors is keep in mind who you already have and do these new people sound different. Yeah, absolutely. Um, more logistically speaking, uh, we do now... Um, try to go outside of our like immediate circle of friends for casting we have for a while yes yeah. yes I, for the past couple of years um but uh we like to work with people that we can work with in person i mean obviously now we can't work with anyone in person yeah. uh but it's really important to us to have like an in-person chemistry between the actors and to be able to rehearse together and record together when possible um and yeah, I mean, I'm not very, I'm not personally very into just like putting out a call for voice actors and like finding random people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is not something that works for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hope that's helpful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if not, if it's not helpful, feel free to let me know. We should have a lot of time for questions at the end here, I think. Yes. Um, yep. Actually, if you do have questions on this topic, um, you can go into the live channel and let me know. I think you've structured this to be a little bit more like lecture heavy than, than typical. Yes. So we can definitely split yes, up Yes, this the is not together. going to be an activity heavy um, mm -hmm. workshop. So if you do have any questions on this topic, let me know. Um, but I'm not seeing anybody typing, so I'm going to move on. How do I write for audio? So, How do I write for audio? So, so if it was really fun for a minute, where when you were in control, but now I'm <laughs> okay, bye. Um, so, real quick before we before we talk about this, I think that it's probably worth clarifying for everybody what our actual roles are in terms of production mm -hmm. for the show. Um, the reason that Sophie's really taking the lead here is because even though we both produce the show, like this is a ton of Sophie's job. Sophie takes a ton of the um, like actual like getting the show running work. I feel like at this point I'm more of like I'm consulted periodically, but I don't do a lot of the nuts and bolts. Mm. Um, I focus mostly on the scripts. In fact, I'd say that my relationship with production is probably similar to your relationship with the writing. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, in terms of writing, I think the fact that I have a foot in production is sort of important mm -hmm. because it's made it so that I have to think about the logistics of how this actually gets done. Right. In terms of writing for audio you got to think about it throughout. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what thinking about it each stage looks like. Um, when you are planning a story, you got to ask yourself, is your concept clear and engaging sound wise? Uh, a story that we've told as an example a few times <laughs> is that um, the Caves of Discord, the first uh, or the first, the second episode of Second Citadel, the first episode when it was like our, you know, next running series in season two, um, our initial concept for the monster in that one was a mirror monster. Have we talked about this in this workshop before? I don't know, so I'll tell you <laughs> very quickly. Um, was a mirror monster, but mirrors don't make a sound. Which is an awesome idea. It's great. Like, it was a cool idea we that had, you only see the monster in your reflection. We had such... In fact, I don't even want to give too much away about it, because we had such a cool plan for that, that, like, if we ever move into, like, a visual medium, I'd love to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, mirrors don't make sound. So the only way to make that work is to have everybody, as if Angelo was always saying, like, begads, now the monster's over there. And it's just, <laughs> it's, it's nonsense. So we were like, what's the audio equivalent of a mirror? Of a mirror. It's echoes, um, is what we decided. We're not scientists. Uh, so that was much more clear and engaging 
sound wise. Okay, right? so apparently we have told this story before in this workshop, sorry. All right. <laughs> but it's still relevant. Yep. Uh, for drafting, how can you make sure all major actions and events have a sound component? This is one that I feel like I didn't pick up for a while, but it is really important. Mm. Um, moments that have impact in the story should have impact for the person listening to the story too, right? Um, so, you know, this is, it doesn't happen every single time. Sometimes when a character is just like saying something that's revealed, there's not much you can do. Um, but one of the things that I really think about when I'm drafting is how can we, you know, make sure that sound is significantly incorporated into this. If somebody's just talking, actually, sometimes I'll think about things like, do they like pound the wall or pound the desk or mm -hmm. does music, is there a music cue or mm -hmm. something, right? Um, because I think that we are much more, you know, for the most part, I think that people are much more visual than like audio, you end up needing to paint in much broader strokes if you want to grab attention in audio um, because I think we're less attuned to it naturally. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you're revising, you've got to keep asking yourself, does your script rely too heavily on characters calling out actions? This is really, 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 really hard. And there's still going to be like... There's still going to be some of it. Yeah. We still do a bunch of it. And my goal is always to cut out as much as I can but clarity's gotta come first. So if it's a situation where you're not sure if the audience is gonna get it, have the character say what's going on. It's a little silly. I always think about it like it's a, like it's an anime that I watched like after high school, uh, the, uh, where like, you know, the characters are shouting out their attacks or whatever. Uh, that helps me to conceptualize it, but whatever helps you to conceptualize that can be uh, really helpful in terms of figuring out, is this actually clear? Or is everything slowing down because characters need to describe to the audience everything that's happening, right? So from the concept, needs to work in terms of sound, needs to be engaging in terms of sound. As you're writing, you need to think about how do I synchronize sound with major moments. As you're revising, you need to ask yourself, does this work on a just sound basis? And where do I need characters to describe what the sounds actually are? Um, yeah. We have some questions. Cool. Um, Let's... How do you know? How do you know how much content is enough? I.e., how many words equals how many minutes? Oh, you definitely have stuff to say about this. I do. Um, so we. I mean, what's funny is that we kind of did it in reverse, in the sense that we just wrote our first couple scripts. And... You're looking so specifically up into that. We <laughs> just wrote. Come back. We just wrote our first. We wrote our first couple <laughs> scripts. Uh, and they happen to be around the same length, and that has been roughly the length that we've been shooting for ever since. Yeah, like, usually our episodes are 40 minutes-ish. Yeah, between half an hour and 40 minutes. Between half an hour and actually way longer. That's I true. mean, Lady of the Lake is like an hour long. Yeah, that's true. But that's that's an outlier. Yes, um, but they can go to 45. Yeah. Normally, yeah. Um, and typically, I will say that I shoot for around 7,000 words for an episode script. Um, sometimes a little more, sometimes it's a little less. Uh, the thing is that calculating like number of pages or words to minutes doesn't always work, uh, especially if you're doing what Sophie suggested earlier, which is really varying how your, you know, actors and characters sound. Mm -hmm. Um, there are some characters who, uh, I had envisioned as speaking very, very quickly and getting their, you know, jokes out very fast. And then when it became clear that the direction the actor was going was not that, mm -hmm. I just have their lines, right? <laughs> I just cut them in half. Um, whereas, like, so for so a hundred words that Rita says is probably about half the length of a hundred words that Jet says, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's just totally dependent on the character. Mm -hmm. um, but seven thousand words for around forty minutes has, has done us pretty well. And I think that our episodes are probably longer than is than most. normal. I mean, I feel like a lot of story podcasts are closer to like 10 to 25 minutes in yeah. length, maybe. Um, but like, we have just never been able to get it shorter than that because that is pretty consistently how long it takes us to get a story arc. Right. Um, I do think that not every podcast does have a full story arc in, every in each episode yeah. like it might take a few episodes um to get a story arc done right and uh just personally we can't stand to do that yeah we just can't stand it i <laughs> it is i guess it's a it's a creative philosophy that we both share that like if we're going to put something out it is going to be 
a satisfying meal by itself. Yeah. Right? And which is not to say that it's invalid if you choose to do otherwise. It's completely a personal thing. That yeah. It's like, look, this is what we like and this is what we're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's why our episodes are the length that they are. Um, I see that you've also asked a question about music, but that doesn't relate to this exactly. So I will try to talk about it in a moment. Cool. Um, yeah, if there are any other questions on this topic, now would be the time to ask while I slowly move to the next slide. Have you said sort of everything you... Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Okay, what kind of sound design software should I use? Let's talk those nuts and bolts. What kind of sound design software should they use? <laughs> okay, so this one is funny for me. Um, I, up until... A couple of months ago, <laughs> used Audacity, the free sound editing program. <laughs> and I say yuck because it's very bad. To its credit, it is free. And we like that about it. But it is a piece of garbage. Um, it is absolutely not intended for what I use it for. <laughs> like... <laughs> Um, in many, many ways. It's it's doable, I mean, because I think up all the way through, oh my god, what was the first? I think the first episode that I stopped using Audacity was like part two of Shadows on the Ship. Yeah, so very recently, like four episodes ago. Yeah, so if you like the way that the show sounded up until then, then that is what can be executed with Audacity. Uh, but... It is a misery. I mean, it's a misery. And I just, I, I don't want you to go into it not knowing that. There are other free sound design programs. Um, I know some people use Reaper. I'm just not recommending it because I have zero experience with it, so I can't speak to it. Um, Audacity is terrible. It crashes constantly, in part because it's not designed to have, like, so many sound files um, and so many tracks. And so if you are going to use it, I'm begging you to save every three seconds and save lots of backups, and you're still going to end up crying about it. Like, it's just what it is. Um, and you also are going to have to come up with a lot of workarounds to use it, uh, because it's just, like, not well designed. Um, so... But, you know, it, it got us as far as it did, mm -hmm. so, like, it, it can be done. The other thing I'd say on behalf of Audacity is that it's very, very simple to just slap something Yeah, it's, it's easy to figure out. Yeah. Uh, I have zero training, as I'm pretty sure I've said before. Uh, my entire sound design experience is just what you hear on the Penumbra and nothing more than that, and... Mm -hmm. Like, I've never taken a class. Yeah, for the two seconds where I was doing the sound design, I used Audacity, and I, I figured out the nuts and bolts pretty, like, pretty yeah. fast. So, so um, you know, it's a good way to get started, and you will be able to figure it out, mm -hmm. and you will cry about it, um, but... Probably better for shorter episodes. Yes. I mean, the longer your episode is, and the, the more stuff you add to it, mm -hmm. the harder it's going to be. Um, oh yes, it, as it's being pointed out to me, it is also true that our show is very heavily designed. That I use a lot of sound effects. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing something that has a much simpler sound, I mean, because our show takes place either in a sci-fi world or a fantasy world, so there's just like tons of stuff going on all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but if your podcast is two people sitting in a room, mm -hmm. You're fine. Like, you'll be fine with Audacity. Yeah. Um, so I may have pumped that, that up a little bit too much. If you're trying to do what I'm trying to do, it's a misery. If you're trying to do something simpler, it should be okay. Um, I, since, ever since Shadows on the Ship Part 2, um, I have been using Pro Tools, which is a paid program. Um, it is expensive, which is why it took us so long to start using it, because we had to be making enough money uh, mm -hmm. to be able to afford it. Um, yeah, really expensive. Um, but if you do get to a point where you can afford it, or if you for some reason have access to it already, it is, it's amazing. Um, it's probably also worth noting with Pro Tools that it's very complicated. It is very complicated. And I did have to have help. Um, from an in, audio engineer. Yeah, from an audio engineer um, in being taught how to use it a little bit. Um, we... 
now record at a recording studio um, and I've made friends with the sound engineer that we work with and like he has been a mentor to me in uh, learning how to use Pro Tools. So there's still a lot I don't know how to do. Um, but definitely like having a grounding in Audacity, even though it is it does not directly translate, if you get used to Audacity, you'll at least know the types of things you're trying to be able to do. Um, so Pro Tools is a lot harder to onboard with than Audacity is. Um, but when you get to a point where you really want to be creating a professional product, like mm -hmm. that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. If you're nasty. Uh, where do I get my sound effects? <laughs> I kind of hate to say it, but I get them at freesound.org. Also very recently, like literally a week ago, I finally bought a sound effects library, which was also very, very expensive. Right. Do you remember how much it cost? Because like, I remember that made my jaw drop. Well, it was on a humongous sale. Yeah. I think it was originally like $1,000 and it was on sale for $500. Yeah. Um, so like it was expensive. Sound is is expensive yeah. um so this whole time before that i was just using uh stuff i found on freesound.org the reason i hate to say it is because if you go to freesound.org and start looking for sound effects you will immediately find all the ones i've ever used <laughs> that will be very embarrassing for me but you know go for it <laughs> um so uh oh and i mean you can also make your own um i mean you technically should be using a different kind of mic for recording sound effects than you would be for recording vocals, but whatever, like I've just been using the wrong kind of mic. If you need specific stuff, you can make it yourself. It's kind of a hassle, mm -hmm. um, but can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to be pretty creative about it, but um, yeah. So that's some sound design basics. Um, how, uh, how do you approach sound editing and design with no experience? And I do have a lot to say about that because that's exactly what I did. Um, so one thing that I think is really important is to clean up your sound effects and your vocal tracks. Um, if you go back and listen to the original Murderous Mask and Shaken, which I also kind of hate to recommend <laughs> because um, they sound like butt. <laughs> if you could do it without anybody getting upset, I think you would take those episodes down. I wouldn't. Like, I don't like to take content away from people. Mm. I guess that's your point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I simply hate the way they sound. But if you do go back and listen, like, you'll notice that one of the biggest differences between when I started and now is that the sound effects were not, like, cleaned up. So, like, every time a new person would talk or a new sound effect would come in, you'd hear like this hissing sound underneath and it makes it sound really artificial. Um, so there is a way um, in even Audacity to clean up the tracks a little bit. Um, and it's called noise reduction. And if you decide to use Audacity, you can look at that. Um, I do think that's really important. It does often create kind of a tinny effect on sounds, um, but um, another, piece of advice I have um, is to layer sound effects a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why our show is so heavily designed. Um, we layer a lot of sound effects on top of each other, but if you put them on top of each other, that makes them sound less bad. Mm -hmm. um, be very detail oriented. Um, you just have to listen to the same tiny little sections over and over again. Uh, when it comes to the vocal tracks, I do a lot of my directing in post-production, so like it's very rare that you'll hear a single uninterrupted take from an actor. I usually have spliced it together from like several different takes because I'm really picky about it. Um, and I also change the timing of people's conversations quite a lot. Um, and it is going to suck. Like again, if you go back and listen to the original Murderous Mask or to Shaken, like it, it kind of sucks. It, it sounds bad. <laughs> um, and you just have to like push through that and you will learn as you go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. A couple more questions. Uh, what kind of flubs do you run into while editing sounds? Like I need clarification on that question. Do you mean, do you mean like mistakes that I made or mistakes that like already had happened in the recordings that I then had to deal with? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was in response to talking about sound effects. So I wonder if they're asking, 
like, you know, did you ever, you know, combine sounds in a certain way that it didn't, you know, it sounded all like what you wanted it to? Oh, I mean, yeah. Like, I, I think the biggest thing that is frustrating to me is um, when it come, it just is, like, incomprehensible the way it comes out, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like, oh, man, the audience can't tell what's happening here. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> are the kissing sounds handmade or store-bought? <laughs> Uh, sadly, they are handmade. <sighs> mm -hmm. And that's why I go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just the worst. Just the worst. I mean, at this point, I kind of reuse ones that, like, yeah. were already made. It's just the worst. Yeah, when we, when we were recording in, like, our, our house instead of a recording studio, and, like, the floors creaked, and, like, things would hit the microphones, and so... I used to do the recording. This is a horrible era. I used to do the recording, and so I'd have to watch the actors very closely to make sure that nothing tapped the mic, which means that when an actor was doing the kissing <laughs> sound effect, we had them kiss into, like, their elbow, right? Um, yeah, or, like, their hand or something, you know. Right. We had them, like, kiss into the elbow of their hand, and meanwhile, everybody else averts their eyes. But... Right, or, like, leaves the room because it's so awful but i had to stare them down the entire time and that is why i have no empathy for people who are tired of the kissing noises none empathy none uh also being asked to clarify that the actors do not kiss each other for the kissing noises right uh if we as a company required them to do that there would be a place for us, and it would be forever jail. That'd be a terrible, terrible thing to I do. I do, okay, so I wouldn't make them do it, but, like, also I do feel like we're weird about it, because, like, if you go see a play, right. people kiss. Right. They don't stand at opposite ends of the stage and, like, mime it. Well, yeah, but there's a difference between a play and, like, a series, you know what I mean? Like, when, when you sign up for a play, you know the script. Yeah, so if you're on a TV show, mm. you might have to kiss next season. I won't. <laughs> anyway, we're getting we're getting distracted. Somebody's asking, do you ever do your own foley when you can't find one? Uh, yes, I think I said that. Uh, sometimes yes. Um, the things that I had the most trouble finding were probably um, horse footsteps. Mm -hmm. um, we still have two coconut halves in our kitchen. Yeah, and probably kitty litter. Yeah, yeah. That sucked. Uh, that was me standing over a frying pan that I filled with kitty litter and taking coconut halves and like... Sometimes... And then kitty litter would just like... Pfft, everywhere. Oh god, it was, there was, it was the second dust bowl in our kitchen. Yeah, because I did that for Coyote of the Painted Plains, so it had yeah. to be like horses in sand in the desert. Yeah. Sucked. One, I think one of the reasons that we have only revisited that storyline very, very rarely is because production-wise, it was a nightmare. Uh, yes, I did use coconuts. Like, there's a reason that's the that's the joke. Oh, because, like, that is what people use. For the yeah, thing. yeah. The, the joke in, in Monty Python comes from the fact that, like, old that is what audio dramas do. actually did what, you know, yeah. his, his guy was doing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, sucked. Um, I also reuse the same sound effects a lot, and I do try to be very careful about it. That's why I say be de detail-oriented. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important to me to have it not be obvious that I'm reusing the same ones, so I like try to cut them up, put them in a different order, layer them so that they don't sound the same every time uh, when I'm reusing them. Mm -hmm. uh, but like horse noises, I reuse those effects all the time because I am not doing that again mm -hmm, mm -hmm. also at a certain point i just start yelling at kevin like can we please write dampier out of this episode because <laughs> i just can't stand it anymore yeah horses are the bane of you yes mm -hmm. uh at that point why not just use an existing sfx um it's uh if you're looking for free sounds that kind of like animal effects are really really hard to come by because you're going to get a ton of like background mm -hmm. sound effects so like yes there are horse footsteps but you can hear the entire like farm around them mm -hmm. and i can't cut that out so like it, that's why i need to make my own in situations like that um also sometimes i act the animals actually a lot of times i act the animals yeah you do like there's some animal noises that you can't do mm -hmm. but like if it's just a horse snorting like i'll do that and then like 
pitch it down so it sounds bigger and more like a horse. Yeah. Dampier is usually you. Dampier is usually me. I mean, I can't whinny, but like I can snort. Mm -hmm. um, or like, you know, when the the crocodile hound is howling, that's me too. Mm -hmm. And I just like change the the pitching of it. So like you can, you can imitate a lot. Mm -hmm. um, okay, some questions are happening. Um, okay, well, <laughs> you could talk for a little bit. Uh, any advice on getting dialogue timing right? Getting dialogue timing sports right. Sports dad and book dad. Oh my god, am I sports dad? Yeah, of course you're sports dad. I've never played a sport in my life. <laughs> I'm jock dad, that's what it is. Yeah, and how to use it to make a moment more dramatic, humorous, etc. Um, I mean, my biggest, my biggest piece of advice for getting dialogue timing right is um, th this is why... I count rehearsal as one of the most important parts of the writing process. It has happened a couple times that just for scheduling reasons, we have needed to skip a rehearsal um, or I have not been able to be there. Um, and that's it's bad. It's, it's bad. It leads to a production process that is really tangled and confusing. Um, largely because, you know, even, even at this point, listening to actors read the lines, I'm constantly learning about how they're going to read them, how they're going to sound, and things like that. My biggest piece of advice for getting dialogue timing right is just make sure that you have the actors run through it, listen to it. Even if we're doing the rehearsal where not all the actors can make it, somebody else will read for the parts that mm -hmm. those actors you know, aren't present for, even if it is just a scene with the actors that couldn't make it, uh, because I need to hear how it sounds. Uh, and so listen to it and adjust accordingly is probably the biggest piece of advice I'd give. Um, I'm getting a question on tips for directing your actors. Oh yeah, I didn't really make any slides about directing. Mm. Um, okay, so something that I have realized over the years is that just a huge part of what directing is is actually kind of the social aspect of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and a big part of my job is just like um, making the actors feel comfortable and good. Yeah. Um, and that has to do with getting to know them and getting to know how they work best and how they're going to deliver certain things and figuring out, like, I mean, this is why it's really nice to work with people for a long period of time is you, you get to, like, understand how they work best and, like, what state of mind they need to be in. And, like... Some actors need to really be pumped up. Like, certain actors, I will not give them as much criticism because then they'll start to feel terrible and they'll do a worse job. And so those actors, I'll be like, you're so amazing. You're killing it. I love everything you're doing. Can you just take this for me one more time for fun? <laughs> I hope they're not watching. <laughs> no, I think they know that I do that. Um, Over time, I had to learn that even if a line is like misread or something and you don't call it out, I've had to learn to just stay quiet and wait because I think that you're... I'm often playing a long game. Yes. You're <laughs> picking my battles. Your ability to play that long game is really, really good. And also, like, you know, you're positioning it so it sounds manipulative, but the, the purpose of it is really just to make the actors comfortable and confident. Mm-hmm. Um, and to, like, get them to do their best yeah. job. And so it's just, like, sometimes, once you get to know your actors, you'll discover that, like, sometimes the best way to get them to do something better is not to say, do it better. Yeah. Um, where, on the other hand, sometimes you get people who, like, really want a lot of critical feedback. And they'll be like, did I do this right? That's true. Can I do this better? How can I change this? Um, and and then those are the people that you, you do want to come forward and, like, say mm -hmm. that stuff to. So a lot of it is just the social aspect and making people comfortable. Um, and, and yeah, like I said, try, um, I, I do think it is really valuable to build a character around an actor, um, both in writing and in directing, mm -hmm. you know, like what, what is it that this person is, where are their strengths mm -hmm. and how can you bring those things to the forefront? Um, I don't think it would have occurred to me to have, Jet changes the character the way that he does over the course of Tools of Rust 
if we hadn't realized that Alexander is just an incredibly versatile and talented actor. Yeah, who we were like criminally underusing yeah. by having him play such a wooden character, which he does an amazing job at, but like he has so much range. Yeah, he, he got in the door from the tone of his voice, but once he was there, we realized like, my God, this guy can do anything. Yeah, yeah, he's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, okay, how do you balance realistic sounds with this gets the point across? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I think that when I started, I wanted things to be as realistic as possible. And that was a massive mistake because this is not real. <laughs> <laughs> and as we've said before, what we're really trying to do here is create an illusion. And that often means not actually being realistic. So for example, if you listen to the early things, like my sound effects were way too loud. Um, because that's how loud I figured they would be in real life. But first of all, that sounds awful. Like it feels bad. It's mm -hmm. painful to listen to. Um, so that's one reason not to do it. And the other thing is that when you're listening to an audio drama, you want to highlight the dialogue. So the dialogue should be in general the loudest thing, except for like really pivotal moments. Yeah. So those sound effects, you have to take them way, way down. Um, another thing is that um, I think we definitely have leaned more in the cartoonish direction, both in writing mm -hmm. and in um, sound design, um, often for the reason of needing to get a point across. Mm -hmm. um, so like moments when, you know, something gets thrown from a really far distance and you hear the cartoon slide whistle like yeah. noise, yeah. Um, which it wouldn't right. make that noise. Right. But otherwise what you're going to hear as the audience is just like a bunch of silence and then splat. You know what I mean? Right. Which sometimes if you want comedy, you could do that. Right. Um, but, but it's actually, I would in general lean more towards making it coherent, mm -hmm. getting your point across and being nice to listen to. Yeah. This is an important thing to consider from the writing standpoint too, because there are lots of shorthands that we have been relying on for a while that if you actually look into them, they're completely ridiculous, but I think that we need them, right? For example, when there is like a standoff and everybody has a gun, the number of times that somebody will cock, cock the a gun. same gun over and over <laughs> Which again. Which you would not do. Shoot. You have to do it once. Right. If that. Actually, I don't even think you have to do it. <laughs> Um, but we need to do it so that you know. Or or like the shing noise when exactly. someone pulls out a sword. But they already pulled out their sword. Right. And they've done it like five times in a row. Right. Next time you're in your kitchen, just take a knife and move it through the air. And you'll notice and it does makes... it ever go shing? No. But that is the sound that we associate with blades moving through air. Right. So you got to do it. Yeah, exactly. Like otherwise you, the audience, won't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do find it useful to think in terms of cartoons in that way. Mm -hmm. um, we are running pretty late. And we have a bunch more slides to go through, yeah. though. Do you want to come back to questions once we go through some more of the slides? Uh, yeah, we can. Um, yeah, okay. When is it time to create a company or a website? Uh, once you already have stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, this should be the last thing you worry about. Like, do you already have a bunch of episodes that you're, like, ready to release? Uh, okay, then you can start thinking about a website. Yeah. Um, and you don't need to create a company until you're already making money. As I think for, as far as we have found, the only real benefit to having a company is that it like legally simplifies how you are supposed to report the money that comes in and the money that you pay. Um, if you are not at that point, if you, and you decide to make a company, literally all you will be doing is paying a lot of money to register for it. Uh, and signing an insane amount of paperwork for literally no benefit. Do not do it until it makes your life easier. Yeah, until you need to. Mm -hmm. um, it's It sucks. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that question was asked in the context of, like, if you have multiple podcasts, mm. uh, but we don't. So yeah, that's true. I can't really answer it in that context. Mm -hmm. That's when we created a company. Once we were starting to make money and trying to pay people. Right. And it was becoming an issue that it wasn't a company. Right. You can also have a name for the production studio that makes all those things, right? Legally, it's not like a company or an LLC or whatever, right? But it helps your audience to understand what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Oh, we're not that far behind. Oh, this never is mind. like the end. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, how do I become incredibly famous and rich with my very successful podcast? I put this in because I sus 
suspect that's the real question that's <laughs> being asked here. Um, yeah, and so one thing that you can think about is marketing. Um, well, actually, the first answer is if you find out, please tell us. For, please. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've been doing this for four years. We'd love to know. Um, fine. Five? Not quite five, not quite five. Like four and a half. Um, okay, so marketing is one thing. Although even here, like, we didn't start, like, market. I, in fact, I don't know that we do really market. Like, we have social media. Yeah. Um, but we live and die by word of mouth. Yeah. And I expect most podcasts do. Yeah. Especially indie podcasts. When we very, very first started, I did the social media stuff. And it was uh, bad for my brain. And so I had to stop. <laughs> Uh, because for I mean a lot a lot of you will probably find that like constantly trying to hunt down people who will like respond to what you're shouting out into the void is incredibly frustrating. Yeah, it's discouraging. If that's your and it also distracted from the writing for me. That became mm-hmm. my main focus. Mm. And so you you can't let that happen. Making making the thing that you are making needs to be your first priority. Yes. Um yeah, so if you like dig far enough back in our Facebook or Twitter or whatever, you'll you know, find the era when I was doing the social media. And then if you dig far enough back, you'll find the era where Kevin was doing the social media at the very beginning. And it's all very embarrassing. Just like, yeah, very just cringily finding ways to tweet about our show as relevant to whatever hashtag was trending it that day. It is so cringe. It's really bad. <laughs> this is like really embarrassing. Oh my God. Before we started the show, we had like a countdown to like, when we were going to release the first episode. Oh, that's true. It was like 30 days until like the first episode of The Penumbra. And it was like, nobody cared. We had like 30 followers. <laughs> we, had, we had 30 followers on Twitter. And they were just our friends who were being nice to us. And they didn't care. Nobody cared. Right. And the thing is, nobody's going to care. Right. And that doesn't say anything bad about you. No, it's okay. I just want you to set your expectations there. Like, nobody's going to be excited that you're making a podcast. Yeah. Because would you be excited? Yeah. I think a mentality that you've really got to get past, but is very common, is, you know, I think I think it's a very common fantasy to, like, get to the point where you can look back at all the people that didn't believe in you and say, like, ha, now you see, right? <laughs> but, like, I think you really do have to get past that. Because the thing is, until you make something and put it out... Nobody will care. They have no reason to believe in you. Okay. They, they really don't. But if you give them a reason, they will stick around yeah. and they'll be invested. And they'll believe, right? Yeah. But you you need to be able to produce the thing to give yes. them that reason. So just know that at the outset, no one will care. And that's okay. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that what you're doing is bad. And it does mean that you should push on. Yeah. But do- like, do not expect people to care. It doesn't even mean they don't love you. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, it's people are busy. And it's really, really hard to get them to listen to your thing, it turns out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so anyway. Um, so, like, I don't... I don't know if we have great marketing advice. Like, no. we made our social media just because we felt like we were supposed to. Uh, and we did a very bad job with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing that happened to us is luck. <laughs> the reason that we developed a fandom at all is because somebody on Tumblr happened to discover the show i have no idea how Mm -hmm. because it was pretty much just our friends listening to it when we started and then we would get so excited when we found out that like we had had a hundred downloads we were like oh my god we don't even know a hundred people like who's listening to this this is so exciting but like somehow some people found it right we had few enough listeners that like i have a i have a friend in germany and like when looking at like the download statistics, whenever a new episode would come out, and I'd see one more download from Germany, I'd You're be like, like, "Oh, there's my friend." Oh, he listened. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, somebody on Tumblr, and it was like a like two or three people yeah. on Tumblr, uh, and we were not yet on Tumblr. We didn't have an account there. Um, but somebody came to our Facebook and was like, "Oh, you should make a Tumblr account for your show because like." I and a couple of my friends are listening and like, mm-hmm. it would be cool to have you there. And I think it was very specifically, um, the, it was the like autistic community, yep. actually the, the ACE autistic community. That's true. Those were like the first people who were listening to the show. Yep. Um, and a couple of people were really excited about it, mm-hmm. became really big fans of it and like started spreading the word. Mm-hmm. 
and it was just luck. Yeah, it was like three people. Yes, and I, I actually I remember exactly who those people are. <laughs> like I remember That's their so weird. I remember their handles at that time, which they may have changed by now. Um, and if you're out there, thank you, um, and I hope you're still listening. Yeah. Um, but it was just like this tiny group of people who like passed it around through word of mouth. We didn't we didn't do anything. No. I think the one thing that we did do eventually was hire an artist. Yes. That I was definitely when we started putting out the art, we saw a big jump. We saw a bump um, <clears throat> once we started having posters yeah. for the episodes. Um, so that is a helpful thing. Even that was kind of luck. Um, we, we were so excited when we first started getting fan art because again, it was like a hundred people listening to the show to us mm -hmm. was like the most exciting thing in the world. And I remember the first piece of fan art we got, it Same. was on lined paper, a pencil drawing. It was the Janus Beast. And it was a drawing of the Janus Beast. I sobbed. And we were so excited because it was just like, oh my God, someone we don't know is listening and cares enough to make fan art of it. Yeah. Like, so I'll never forget um, but, but then, uh, when we saw Michaela Buckley's fan art, that mm -hmm. was like one of the first pieces of fan art we had gotten that was like by a very experienced artist. Right. And we were like, oh my God, this is the best thing we've ever seen. And we reached out to her. Yeah. Um, and, and she joined the team. And I think like the art was also helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, but that is almost all the advice I can give yeah. as far as like getting it out there because like, I don't think. It's to our, I don't really think it's to our credit. Yeah. And the other thing is, I think that it's not just that I don't have good advice. I think there just isn't a ton of good advice yeah. because it is going to be luck, but it's also going to be that you have a good consistent product. Yeah. I think in terms, that's all you have control over. I think in terms of setting your expectations too, I know when we started, my thought about how things spread was it was all exponentially. You know, somebody shares it with their friend who shares it with all their friends, and so it grows like that. But it, the it thing didn't. is, it does not work like that. Mm -mm. Um, it grows in bursts. And so the way that I've had to start thinking about it is it's a little bit more like, you know, you have a pool of water that slowly fills, and once it gets to a certain point, it spills off and enters, like, another pool of water, right? So... Oh, yeah. Right? Like finds a new community. Exactly. You will... Because eventually, you know, a bunch of people will share it with all their friends, but then they've talked to all their friends. Right. And they have the same friends. Right. So there's nobody else to spread it to. Um, so just to set your expectations, progress comes in bursts when it comes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and if you see drops, don't feel bad. <laughs> you just got to focus on making the thing. Um, and one other thing that I think it's really important that I say here, um, this is not advice. This is just an acknowledgement, which is that as far as we've come, and I will talk about what success means for us in a minute, but like even our measure of success, that has come due to an immense amount of privilege mm -hmm. that not everybody has. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's right to not acknowledge that. Um, because when we started making this show, before it was a show, it was just like a project we were doing, even once we had put it on, you know, podcast apps and stuff. It was just like a thing we were doing. We were not making any money mm -hmm. until the end-ish of the first season. Yeah, I think we the first episode that we put up on Patreon was like Janice Beast Part 2. Yeah, and like uh, we somebody's mom and like a friend who were our patrons. Right. And we were making like $20 on an episode, yeah. you know? Um, and so like the way this came to be is that I got fired from my my full-time job working in an office and we had already started working on the show and I was unemployed for a whole summer and putting all of my time into working on this show, um, which is like when we were sort of able to ramp things up a little bit, I was able to get a lot better at sound design during that time because I had a lot more time to spend on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I had still been at my full-time job, I wouldn't have been able to do that or it would have taken me so much longer. And the reason I was able to do that is because at the time Kevin and I were in a relationship and he paid my rent. Yep. He paid my rent and my grocery. Bills. And my job was stable enough and like didn't pay great, but paid enough that I had enough extra money to buy all of our recording equipment. Out yeah, of yeah. Yeah. And yeah. neither of us had any debt. Yeah. Which is a huge privilege. Yeah. 
Um, and, and so like we weren't hampered by that, yeah. but without all that stuff, we would not be where we are now. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if we would have ever gotten here, but if we had, it would have taken way longer. Yep. And I want to be really upfront with that because I worry that people think that like, oh, if you just grind hard enough, like things will if happen. You, if you just grind hard enough, you have a nervous breakdown, <laughs> speaking from personal experience. Uh, and I'm not saying don't work hard on it, but I am saying like that's another part of setting your expectations um, is that just like luck and privilege are a really big part of it. Um, and so like I, I want you to be fair to yourself in assessing those things um, and, and not to give us too much credit for yep. what we have achieved because we were just given things, mm -hmm. you know? Like, to not have any debt, that's just to be given something. Mm -hmm. Just a huge leg up. Um, and I really want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. So, I'm sorry if that's a downer. <laughs> um, so the biggest lesson is focus on making a thing that is good and that you enjoy. Uh, that is the most important thing. That's the only thing you really have control over. Yes. You can't control who listens to it, who discovers it, who passes it around. That stuff will happen or it won't. Um, but if you are making a thing that is good and that you enjoy and that you stand by, you really increase your odds yeah. of that happening. I think that's why people say make your own luck. Yeah. Um, this is harder than a marathon and it's definitely not a sprint. And the way that it's harder than a marathon is it's like if you were running a marathon and you didn't know where the finish line was, you just knew that at some point while you were running, someone was going to stop you and say, that was one of the finish lines. Just FYI, right? <laughs> so you've got to pace yourself for some point in the future that you have no idea when or if it's coming. Um, one of the only ways to emotionally keep that up is you'd better like doing this because you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. Yeah. 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 Um, so set expectations for yourself and for the people that you're working with. So again, we had people acting on this show, writing music for this show, doing stuff for this show for free yeah. for a long time before we were able to get to the point where we could pay them. And if they hadn't been doing that stuff for free for that whole time, we would never have gotten to the point where we could pay them. Mm -hmm. So you have to like, you have to be ready for that. And the people you work with have to be ready for that. And like, you can't make anyone be up for that. I mean, yeah. that's a very big ask. I think the reason that we got away with it is because we didn't intend it to be a business to begin with. We just were playing around. So no one was expecting to get paid. Um, and yeah, so it's like the fact that we make money now is built on the backs of a lot of people's free work yeah. for a long time. Absolutely. Um, We've done our best to make it up to them, but like... Right. Yeah, and I don't know, like think about if you think that's ethical too. Right. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big question. Yeah. Genuinely. Um, yeah. Um, don't get ahead of yourself. Um, I think that a lot of times people get so excited. And I totally understand why this is, because when you're about to start a project, everything is so exciting. Uh, but don't get ahead of yourself with like marketing and money and stuff until you've got your product there. Like, you know, um, until you have like a few episodes under your belt. Mm -hmm. Just don't, just don't go there. Mm -hmm. Like, and don't start telling the entire world that you have this thing until you have a thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, making money on the internet is a racket. It really is. And it, <laughs> to an extent that is incredibly unfair and that is not your fault at all. We're, we're not guilting anybody here, but we think it's important to keep on reminding our audience what this actually looks like. Yes. Right. So, um, hmm. I mean, if, you are asking these questions to us. You probably think we are successful mm -hmm. um, in some respect. And we are in by some metric, but I do want you to understand what that means mm -hmm. because to date, I am the only person who makes a full-time living off of the show. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who work on the show, um, but just about everybody else has other full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. Kevin has another part-time job. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm the only person who works on it full time. And the amount of money that I make is now finally just about as much as my last entry level office job. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not making big bucks and I work so much harder and so much longer and I have so much more responsibility. Right. 
Um, so I'm making a lot less per hour than I was. And how many how many listens are we at at this point? Um, we are getting towards six million downloads all time. Yeah. So. So it <laughs> so it's a it's a, a huge number of people, and we're so so grateful for that, right? Yes, and we're really lucky. Yeah, we are incredibly lucky, and in fact, the the people that listen to our show have been more receptive to supporting us than I think a lot of others. And so we're so grateful for your generosity. Mm -hmm. And we, we, it's just really important to keep in mind that like we're, we rely entirely and you will, if you make a show that you want to make some money, you will rely entirely on other people's generosity. Mm -hmm. Um, there it's, you know, you're, you're not going to make much. And when you make some, it's not going to be nearly as much as the work that you put in. Mm -hmm. Um, so you'd better love it because because otherwise I don't know what else would pull you through it. Right. Yeah. Like you cannot do this because you're expecting it to be a big success. Yeah. Because again, like to be honest, like we're tiny. We, you yeah. know, like we are we are not actually a big success, especially if you look at the scope of the internet as mm -hmm. a whole. Like it, it's, a, it's a very very small amount of people who listen to the show. We are not famous. This is not. Yeah. You know, a big deal thing. Um, so. Yeah. So I just want you to set your expectations accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that all may sound very discouraging, um, but I, I do still want you to do the thing. Yes. I just want you to know what you're getting into um, and not to make yourself unhappy by having expectations. It's very, very, realistic. if your expectations are too high, it's very, very tempting to essentially just try to sprint to that point. Think if I work hard enough, I can get there faster. It really doesn't exist. You need to think about how can I do this consistently over a long period of time? Because I think it's more like, you know, every every week we put out an episode where rolling the dice, you know what I mean? And all you can do is make sure you roll the dice a bunch of times mm -hmm. uh, and then hopefully somebody notices it. Um, yeah. So we're running low on time. Um, I think that was our last slide. slide I think so. Yeah. Um, so I do have a couple of questions here that I'm seeing. Um, how do you get your podcast up in terms of getting a feed up and actually getting it out there? Um, I'm not going to get into this because it's Googleable. Um, there are podcast hosting services that yeah. you have to pay for like monthly or yearly. Mm -hmm. is the show uh, we use Simplecast, yeah. uh, but you, you can just Google it. That's what we did. And like there, there will be how to's. Yeah. There are a bunch of Simplecasts is done well by us. So we haven't seen a need to look at any others. Yep. Um, is there a functional difference between a listener downloading and just clicking play on a podcast app? God, I have no idea. No clue. None. The other thing is that, like, the the way these platforms work sucks. Yeah. They do not make it easy for you to figure out, um, like, your statistics or anything like that. It's very confusing. We don't really have a good sense of how many listeners we have. We'll, yeah. We will never know. We yeah. will never know because it could be the same 10 people listening yeah. to the episodes a million times. Like uh, uh, Apple Podcasts will not even surface the number of subscribers that we have just right. to their service. Yeah, so, so no idea. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you do your entire episode in one sitting or do you record in bits and pieces? Uh, we try to do as much as we can at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are, I mean, of course, now we can't record in a studio anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody is recording from home. So there are various restrictions. Um, you will rapidly find that you are at the mercy of your actor's schedules. Yep. Uh, you will live and die by your actor's schedules. Uh, and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to have people do as much as possible as together as possible because I find that gets the best result. But a lot of times it doesn't happen and you have to record other bits separately. Um, stuff like uh, bit parts, often that's me and Kevin uh, recording at the last minute mm -hmm. in the house. Um, so it it's a mix. Um, what elements of stage acting carry over into directing for audio? Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure how to answer it. You've talked in the past about how stage acting has to be very big like to communicate what it's doing. Yeah. And I think that acting and audio kind of needs to do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I think that's also a little bit my style. That's true. That's true. Um, I, I like to go a little bit more over the top. Um, mics. We can give a direct 
recommendation here, right? Because we've used the same one for a while now. Yeah. I think we just bought some more. Where is it? It's not amazing, but it will do a job. It's a relatively cheap but quality uh, entry level mic. Yeah, this is the Audio Technica ATR2100 USB. Uh, you can plug it into um, a mixing board, but you can also plug it right into a computer, um, which doesn't get quite as good a result, but it will totally work. Um, and it, it's what we're doing now. Again. How much do those cost now? Do you know? When we bought them, they cost 80 bucks each. I don't remember how much they cost. Pro probably around there. Um, yeah. Close to 100 maybe. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with everyone recording remotely? Is there an issue with mic quality? Uh, not so much mic quality as room quality, um, because if everyone is in a different room, you will immediately notice rooms sound different. Echo happens differently. You'll hear sounds going by. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the biggest things you need to figure out is setup. So some people need to get under a blanket. Uh, some people need to go in the basement. Like you want to do your best to make it consistent mm -hmm. uh, between actors. Uh, it's horrible though. I, I hate it. I really miss when we recorded in the studio. Um, yes, try to make the actors have as consistent a setup as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Receiving word, those Audio Technica mics are around $90. So um, they've gone up in price actually. Yeah. Um, how do you practically record? Do you put all your actors in the same room and record the conversations with different mics? Or do you record them one by one without anyone else talking? Okay, so we, when we started the show, yes, we put them all in the same room and recorded the conversations each with their own separate mic. Something that you will immediately notice that is a problem there is you will get bleed over, right? So you will hear, uh, hear someone talking picked up in somebody else's mic. Mm -hmm. And that will become a problem once you want to edit. Right. Especially if you have that range of voices. Like, M. Sutherland used to get his voice picked up on every mic in a 10-mile Right. Radius. Some people have really echoey voices. So, ideally, you want to be in a situation where you are not having actors getting picked up on each other's mics because it will upset you when you get to editing. Um, so, our best situation we ever had was in a recording studio where everyone was in their own separate... Uh, soundproofed space, but they could kind of see each other through the windows, so they could still act opposite each other, uh, but there was no sound bleed over. Mm -hmm. um, now that we are quarantined and everyone is recording separately, on the bright side, there's obviously no bleed over at all, mm -hmm. but also it's very hard to get chemistry. Yeah. <laughs> um, as someone who has no access to a recording studio because there are none there, how would you suggest one should go about recording them? Well, we don't have access to a recording <laughs> studio now either. Um, and, and we didn't for a very long time. It's only like the past year and a half that we've been to a recording studio. Um, yeah, we recorded in this room that you all are seeing around us right now, actually. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you just want to... I mean, and, and also now you won't want to record physically with people. Mm -hmm. um, but basically you just want to set people up in situations that are as consistent as you can. Mm -hmm. um, so you do want to test it out. So like do some test recordings and put them together and see if people sound like they're in the same place. And if they don't, you're gonna have to make some adjustments. Uh, no sport dad and maybe sport dad, I love that. I'm, de um, I'm definitely a no sport dad too. Please don't, don't, don't come at me. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I promise that our next workshop will be about, um, like, writing a serial already, drama. Already starting to plan it. We've, we've heard you. Uh, people have been asking that since literally the first time. So we're going we're gonna to close our lessons out on that. Uh, before you actually have the final script, do you recommend doing a read-through with the actors? Uh, yeah, Kevin does finalize after we do I need a read-through with the actors. It's part of the writing process. Um, and we're looking out for if they struggle with anything or you'll notice when people are reading it out loud, like, oh my God, this monologue is going on forever. Yeah. When you might not notice on the page. Maybe one more question. Um, do, do... I've actually got to be back in a sec. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, how about... Uh, what are some ruts you've run into while creating a podcast? Disagreements, low motivation, things not linking up in the story. Um, I think we've mentioned this a little bit before. Um, we do disagree sometimes, and the way we we figure it out is, like, both of us have veto power. So if we don't both love something, we're not going to move ahead with it. Um, 
we have low motivation all the time, but that's the good thing about collaborators, which is that um, you, you are responsible for like living up to your collaborators expectations. So like, even if you don't feel like doing it, um, like other people are counting on you. So that definitely helps with motivation. You got um, me on my back? Yep. All right. Um, and uh, casting has changed a lot over time. It used to just be me being like, hey, person that I know that I've acted with in the past, will you do this thing for us? Um, so our original group was Joshua, Noah, Kate, um, and Dan Squizero. Yep. That was because, like, I had acted with them at school. Yeah, and they were close by. And they were physically close by. Um, and then after that, it was like, oh, a couple of people that I had, like, been in local theater with mm -hmm. um, or performed with before, and then... Um, we branched out a little bit. Um, a lot of it came through Noah's theater connections mm -hmm. and he would like ask people he had worked with to submit, um, auditions, but like he could already speak for them yeah. in a way, like, cause he had already worked with them. Mm -hmm. Um, so he, he knew that they were good to work with and were talented. And then I would just blindly listen to their submissions, um, mm -hmm. and make a decision. Um... Unionize the Rats is asking a question that I think is important because we were talking about keeping sure. up the momentum. Let's uh, end with that. Yeah. Unionize the Rats asks, about, uh, asks, how do you keep momentum for you, the writer? It doesn't matter how enthusiastic I am. I can never write anything longer than like 11,000 words. One of the big things that I had to learn is that, unfortunately, you cannot wait around for enthusiasm. Um, you need to get yourself into a place where you do it even if you hate it. Uh, and it just becomes a habit, right? Because... Uh, the reason that 11,000 words really speaks to me is because if you add a two-parter together, that is around the word count where I feel like I messed everything up and mm -hmm. I should throw it in the trash. Um, the only way that I get through that is through a week or a couple weeks of just grinding, and it's the worst. Uh, it is absolutely my least favorite part of the writing process. No contest. But if I don't push through that, I will never get to the parts that I really like. So sometimes, even if you enjoy doing this, or even especially if you enjoy doing this, I would say, um, it's work. And uh, that really, really stinks. But if you can get yourself to a place where you're always telling yourself, I didn't want to do this today. I did it anyway. It's bad, but I did it. Uh, and so, and I should be celebrated for doing this thing I didn't feel like doing on my own time. Um, that is one of the biggest things that you can do for yourself. It's not about always loving your story every time you sit down to write it it's about being proud of yourself for pushing through in the moments where you would rather do anything else yeah yeah that's true um okay i think we're going to wrap it up there so yes because a lot of people have asked um next week we're going to be covering writing a serial um and juggling like the plot of an episode versus the plot of a season um so I'm excited for that. Um, and do we have homework? Uh, you planned this lesson, so. I don't have homework. Uh, well, we never, we never. I'm not a teacher. <laughs> we, ne we never have homework. Right, right, right. Oh, cool. So you're the cool substitute teacher that makes me look Excuse bad. me, I'm not a substitute teacher. Your um, home seat work it, this week is, uh, let's say, same as, as last week. Uh, submit another 200 uh, word section of what you're revising. Yay! A lot of people are submitting uh, beginnings, and that's great. We've read a lot of beginnings at this point. I'd love to see some people submit some things from uh, deeper into whatever story you're writing. Okay? Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I hope that this was helpful. Um, I am not a teacher, so I know that my slideshow was not interactive and was very lecture heavy because I like to hear myself talk. Um, it's a good thing you talk well. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> see. Uh, so we'll see you next week. Oh, and uh, the next episode is coming out tomorrow for patrons and <laughs> Tuesday your, for everybody else. That is your favorite thing to do is just to drop it on them like that, isn't it? Well, I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited too. It's a really, really good one. Uh,
Um, so we'll see you next week, everybody. And you'll hear from us tomorrow. Yay! Some of you. Bye. Bye.